everybody welcome to another episode of the saint mort show i'm here with brian fitzy who i first discovered on youtube when a, a past guest kyle had posted his music video of him covering poison by bell bib devoe <laughs> and then the more i looked into the videos the more i was like this guy's awesome and then i noticed that there was a lot of philly related stuff in his videos and i was like I think this guy might be from nearby <laughs> uh so i contacted him and he he did a show a couple months ago and he wowed the crowd, and uh, I'd been wanting him to be on the podcast for a while, so I'm very excited to finally have uh, Fitz here. Yes. We've been trying to work our way around each other's schedules for at least three months, Easy. If, if not more. Easy. Um, so you do a very unique thing live. I mean, you also do the stuff with the live backup band. Yes. But you do live looping, where you basically provide... All of the musical background, and that's not saying like a guy with an acoustic guitar just playing acoustic guitar. That is, you beatboxing the drums and and adding in the bass lines and doing a whole bunch of other stuff. That it's it's hard to explain. It really is. You have to see it and hear it to totally understand what we're talking about. I think that's probably accurate. <laughs> <laughs> How did you discover that you had the talent to do this type of layering music? <clears throat> it was um, actually kind of out of necessity. So. I was playing with uh, all size, all different sizes of bands, and when I put out my um, my very first solo record, I went over the top with production. So I did these big string sections, and I did multiple keyboard parts, and just a ton of stuff. And I realized um, really quickly that the only way I was going to be able to do that was with a really large ensemble. So we do the record release show and everything. I have a 14 piece band it's just like over the top big <laughs> horn section everything but we're able to do the music and that's like i love that i love that but it's really impossible to go on the road with a band that size unless you're playing rooms that would make that size ensemble like kind of look like uh they're too small to fit the stage yeah. so <laughs> it was really out of necessity it was like all right i gotta pare things down pare things down pare things down and um I, I was starting to see a bit more people, uh, you know, and not that many still, but I saw a handful of people doing stuff with uh, live looping, and my sister, uh, who's a musician, she's down in Nashville now, she um, had gotten into it as well, and uh, actually Boss, uh, which is the company that both of us have loop stations from, um, was doing a competition internationally, um, and my sister entered it and made it into the international level, and uh, was competing with some really really killer people that were doing really interesting stuff and they brought her on they roland and boss really liked her so they brought her on as a spokesperson nice. for the current line of the pedals and uh i uh i think it was maybe around that point that all this was happening i'm like i need to start doing stuff with this this is so powerful because for a long time even on solo gigs i was pre-recording at home the the drums and the bass and the guitar if I was going to just... And having like an in. iPod hooked up. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, while it allowed me to do stuff that, you know, I wanted to be able to do and still be able to play all my instruments, um, uh, being able to do it all live in front of people is, is so much better. And being able to have all that creative freedom and everything's different every night. Like the set is always... The songs are going to be done differently slightly. Well, and the other thing to factor in is... You know, especially if you're like a, a local band that's not on like a, a massive mainstream level. Yeah. When you play a show, you usually have to rely on your covers yeah. to be the way that people know you. You actually can get away with doing an entire set of originals and maybe one cover because people are going to remember seeing how those songs came to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a kind of a, it's got to be a very freeing thing as a musician to be yes. able to be like, I can actually focus on my music and not, you know, have to split time in my set between originals and covers and hoping that people remember the covers enough to check out the originals when they get home. Right, right. <laughs> it's, you know, playing covers, because I, I started doing that, um, you know, for, for me, I, I remember there being a period of time when I was younger where it was like covering 
be doing a cover was was frowned upon. I remember it was just like, oh, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing, uh, no artistic merit to that, and there's blah 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 blah. This is when I'm like 11, 12 years old, yeah, yeah. Like starting <laughs> starting to play in bands, <clears throat> and I realized. I remember my, my mom is uh, was the front woman of a really really successful club band in the seventies, and um, her um, so her her ear and everything. I always got plenty of critique on this and this and that. Every band I played in when we were rehearsing and. From the business side, she always gave me really good feedback. So she was always just like, you know, if you can do a cover faithfully to the original, like if you're, if you can do it better than the original artist is really the goal. Like that's that takes a lot of skill. And I so I did so many different covers and stuff. And I realized actually quite recently that having played covers and um, for for the better part of like 15 years now. Um, I realized that the stuff that I, I choose cover wise, um, and the way that I perform it, it has has is now there's a, a like a homogenous uh, uh, like uh, uh, element to it. So I'm able now I realize that that's like a distillation of me. Yeah. And my co- my original music is essentially the result of all that stuff. And I I realized recently that um, that it's the result of playing all those covers have it. it had influenced my original music and how I write it and how I play and I it. Think that that ha- I think that that happens with a lot of musicians where yeah. it's like, you know, you can listen to, to a band's discography and in a weird way you can be like, oh, this is when they really got into the Beatles. And like, this is exactly, when they did, like, yeah, you, yeah. Like you find that moment where their music takes this tonal shift to like a different genre or a different sound. Mm-hmm. Um, well, what I think is funny is that your, your original music doesn't, like, there's definitely like a little bit of hip hop influence in it, yeah. but there's not a straw, like, it's not like, like you would never be classified as a hip hop artist by right. any stretch of the imagination, but that seems to be the covers that are the most entertaining for you to do. Oh yeah, <laughs> well it's because there's so much weird production in those songs. Yeah, like, there is. I well, I grew up in um, I grew up in Coatesville, and um, you know being uh, being a kid that played violin, you know that's. It's it's maybe maybe wasn't the most favorable school to. You were to, super excited to, when back that thing came up, and you're like, "See, violin can be cool." Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was it was kind of juveniles weird. using it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was kind of a weird, you know, uh, a, a little bit of a tricky thing. But I played a bunch of other instruments, and um, I the first thing I ever did, and at least the first thing I ever remember doing, is being like five or six years old, and I used to walk around the house beatboxing, and I didn't know yeah. what it was. I don't even know how I heard someone do it in the first place but i did since i was able to talk i used to impersonate any any sound or voice that i heard i would i would just like be able to hone in on it and do it and i remember hearing a percussion on stuff and i would try to duplicate that so i'd walk around the house and it wasn't until i got to like maybe age nine or ten that I was doing that on the school bus and somebody was like, yo, you can beatbox? And I was like, beat what? <laughs> so like... I'm not looking yeah. for a fight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so it was like, it, that was that was a crazy uh, moment. So I, I was, I really got into like um, underground hip hop and stuff. So when I was, I remember in high school, I was, there would be freestyle battles in the cafeteria and I got very good at that and um <laughs> kind of made a name for myself doing that during during the lunch um period and then when i got to in college early in college i actually produced like countless amounts of of tracks for uh, for hip hop artists and i put out mixtapes i mean i i did hip hop like <laughs> as a at, like that was a main main major focus well and i i think that your cred uh to use a, a word that people don't use anymore. <laughs> um, I think your cred still stands. Um, I remember you doing the show for Chords for a Cure. Yeah. And a uh, past guest on here, Khalil, Sinister K, had shown up to the show just to hand out his mixtape and leave. And the most entertaining part of your set was watching him watch your set. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Because he was... Um, there's there's the Aziz Asari joke about uh, you know black people are fascinated by magic like that was his reaction to everything was just like throwing his hands in the air. Just, I mean, he was getting down. I actually I, now I remember that now I know exactly who you're talking about because I pay attention to the crowd. I might not remember everybody's name, but I remember he the walked, faces. Oh, and he the, walked over to me. He's like, I got to get him to do a track on my next mixtape. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like even with the stuff that you're doing which like you only did one rap cover you did you did yeah. poison 
because I think I had told you that that's how I'd first seen you. Yeah, that was specifically um, why I did it. That's the first hip hop song I ever heard. It's such a great song. Yeah. Uh, I can't even think of what the first hip hop song was. I remember I got into like really lame hip hop. <laughs> like <coughs> like rap was like blowing up in the 90s and there was like Notorious B.I.G. and Tupac and I think the first rap song that I loved was Skilo, I Wish. Like that was where I was like, oh man, <laughs> there's so many possibilities for this genre. And then it was like Boom Bostic by Shaggy. Like, Oh my like, God. Oh, my, 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 yeah. my. I was like, I'm all about that G-rated hip hop. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, you know, I mean, that that stuff was really popular when I was a really little kid. I mean, well, um, that's like that, I was MC Hammer, man. Well, like, that was, I remember watching him doing Too Legit to Quit, like the music video for and that. Telling you to pray. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just to that make was, it today. Yeah, I didn't even know who that was. I, so what happened is I was, we, my family went on two vacations my entire life. Okay. Um, and they were both, it was when I was five or when I was six. Or six and seven. Yeah, I think it was five and six. I was like just about to start kindergarten after the second one. And it was in the summer for a week, and we went down to Virginia Beach. And we stayed in this beach house when I was six. And I had a I, – from the time I was like two, I had a little – my first Sony, a little tape deck that you could carry yeah. around. And you could record – on it and uh, I remember none of the cassettes that I'd been given when I was a really little kid from my uncles and my parents so I had like Earth, Wind and Fire and like old Genesis and Beatles and I had um, um, yeah just uh, like Peter Gabriel's like the record So with Sledgehammer yeah. and everything just like so that I mean like that kind of says I think a lot about me now but I would walk around the house with it pl- blasting it all the time and I remember um, I ruined quite a few of the cassettes because I love the sound of interrupting the audio by hitting the record button yeah. and getting that like machine gun stutter and stuff. Yeah. So I have so many tapes, and I, when I find them now and then, I'll, like, I'll put them in. I'm like, ah, I was a little kid when I had this. Have you seen the documentary uh, Beats Rhythm in Life? About yes. Tribe Called Quest yet? Yes. It makes me think of when they talk about how Q-Tip used to make the songs by literally just playing the 10 second clip on the record over and over again and recording it to a cassette tape. Yep. Because that was the only way he knew it was how the to only make way, an yeah, instrumental he, track. Yeah, it didn't, have the, <laughs> it didn't have the MPC. I mean, that was, <laughs> that was <clears throat> actually a lot of my early stuff was experimenting with tapes like that, two tape decks together and hooking them up in um, in series or parallel or whatever way worked. And That was like how I, I feel like I got into video editing out of necessity of I would tape uh, Saturday Night Live late at night and I would like some skits and not like other ones. So I eventually learned that I could hook two VCRs together. <laughs> yes. And I could just make one tape that was like seven hours of all the skits that I liked with over no that commercials. year. With no commercials. And chop it all up. So yeah. when, I, when I was in high school and that was the way that they were editing videos still before we got digital equipment, I was like killing it. In yeah, the yeah. Editing. I was like, <laughs> I know exactly when to cue yeah, this up. Yeah, exactly. When, <laughs> it's, it's amazing, you know, what you learn out of necessity. And I, I just... I remember playing with that thing and I dropped my cassette behind the bed that I was sleeping in and I, I reached down and I thought I grabbed the tape and it actually somebody had dropped a mixtape under the bed and I pulled the tape up and I threw it in the deck and it was a mixtape that somebody had put together, you know, the old school way where you, you dub to another deck yeah. and it was Bell Bill, uh, Bell Biv DeVoe's uh, Poison was, uh, was the first song that I heard that played and then it was Prey and then CNC Music Factories, Everybody Dance Now, <laughs> which I like... I got so into break dancing like a year or two later, and I remember just like every night after dinner, I'd come in the house and I put the tape deck like on the on the kitchen counter. And I'd like put the cardboard down and I'd be like, "I'm gonna do work," and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. So it's but it's, there's something yeah. really cool, and I've talked about this before. There is something super powerful about that moment that you find out that there's music that exists outside the world of your parents' yeah, music. Yeah. Um, for me, it was. It kind of comes back to rap, but like not totally. My cousin got really into rap. Okay. So much so that he was just like, I'm done with all this old music and gave me his collection, his old CD collection. Hmm. And he regrets it now. But I went from only knowing that Meatloaf and uh, Bruce Springsteen existed, like that was the extent of my musical knowledge, to in one day, I had the first three Green Day albums, two Offspring albums, every Nirvana CD, mm. and Soundgarden. And it was just like hearing that music uh, on the first two Stone Temple Pilot CDs. Oh. So like hearing all that, it was just kind of like, wait, you can play music this loud? Like you can play music this fast? And it was just this 
Like, I didn't know you could do this. <laughs> like, it's the truth. It's, I, was, I was a huge Steely Dan head, and I still am. It's my favorite band, and I grew up listening to that. Him and George Benson, especially, and Al Jarreau and stuff. Like, Give Cats. me an album to listen to by them, because I always hear how great Steely Dan is, <laughs> oh, and yes. really the only thing I know by them is that they did a really cool cover of... Uh, what, East Coast Toodaloo or whatever it is, but oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the only on, thing I've ever heard by him. I so. believe that's on Pretzel Logic. Um, th- my favorite records of theirs are uh, the Royal Scam, okay, and Asia. Right. And I got to see. I've seen them uh, twice now. I've seen uh, a couple. It, basically, Steely Dan minus uh, Walter Becker. I saw them uh, in AC. That was the most recent show that I saw them, and that was in place of Walter was. Michael McDonald and Boz Skaggs, and they did a handful of each of their own tunes, respectively, and maybe a, one or two Steely Dan tunes. Uh, actually, a couple more than that. And then they just did whatever cover song they wanted, and they just it was like a whole show of just covers. And it was <laughs> they played for like two and a half hours, and it was mind blowing. But uh, I remember I grew up on that kind of stuff for the most part, and I remember the first time you know it's like really produced music coming from a, a jazz discipline, and. Um, I remember being like 11 years old and hearing Nirvana for the first time. And Nirvana had, had been out, you know, for, for they'd been around for a couple of years. I discovered Nirvana like, a, like six months after Kurt Cobain died. And I somehow yeah. didn't know that he had died. <laughs> so when MTV was doing like their year roundup, they had mentioned it. And I'm like, oh my God, he's dead? Yeah. Like, I was like, yeah. six months behind the rest of the world. <laughs> I remember being in fourth grade and the girls coming into school uh, the the day after and crying in class, uh, wearing their Nirvana shirts and their Green Day shirts, the Dookie shirts. The do- I, we used to, those were banned at my school. It, I don't think they <laughs> lasted very long either, mine, yeah. I just remember them bawling and... Uh, and I wasn't into the band at the time, um, but I remember getting a ride home from uh, school one day, uh, a really good friend of mine, and he had a sister who was, um, you know, like the stereotypical. She was Daria, basically. Oh man, um, she was. She was. Yeah, I'm jealous that you even knew one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my whole life's been the conquest to find a real life <laughs> Daria or Jane. She. I gotta. I gotta. I gotta say, not as not as not anything you think it is. It, yeah. It, it, yeah, she was miserable to be around. But so uh, <clears throat> we get a ride home, and she um she used to listen to Y one hundred, which became my favorite station after hearing. So she puts Y one hundred on, and uh, I heard back to back uh smells like teen spirit and bullet will butterfly wings by um smashing pumpkins yeah. and i was like i had never heard anything like that so yeah. like another just like Poof. so i was cleaning up my brain from the back seat that literally and, uh, must it have was been, I, nuts, was, I remember listening to y100 after if that was when you first started listening to y100 then you would just miss the train on a uh, wdre mm-hmm. which was the which was like the grunge station that basically died along with kurt cobain <laughs> Because now it's like a rap station, I think. Uh, they all are. 3.9, but it was, that used to be like the grunge station until like 94. Okay. And then it just disappeared. Yeah, and it, was right around like, it was right around 94, 95. <laughs> like, I, yeah, yeah. And I mean, like Y100 was amazing. Like I still have vivid memories. Sure. There are certain songs that I'll hear that will trigger memories of like the summer, sitting outside with the radio just blasting all the, you know, 96. space hog. In oh yeah, meantime. in the meantime, yeah. And like, oh my god, so many great songs. And like there's something there's something about when you were a kid who listened to the radio obsessively that you remember all those like minor singles that no one else remembers. Uh-huh. Like do you remember um this is a really obscure one, but I fucking love this song and no one remembers it. The Space Monkey Sugarcane. It's like sweet sugar cane in my brain. I don't wanna, I don't wanna oh go my insane. God. <laughs> yeah, I do remember. Like, and that. it was like never on the hit. Like it was never a hit, but every once in a while they'd be like, "Oh, we gotta fill some space. Let's play the Space Monkeys <laughs> Sugar Cane." <laughs> like, <clears throat> there was there were there were a couple songs like, like that. There were a lot of Y100 well, really supported the local bands too. So I remember hearing um a, Huff a Moose was like Huff a Moose. That's the song that always, was literally. Yeah. That song made me. I remember the first time I heard that, and I didn't know what it was about the song, but it made me. Feel really friggin' weird, and I like I like, and I don't know if I liked it. So like, it would come on and be like, I don't know about this song. And I'd be like, put like, uh, I always see, there's a local CD yeah. store that always has a signed Huff of Moose CD for sale for like twenty five dollars, <laughs> and I'm like, I, I I don't even remember what the song sounds like, so there ain't no way I'm paying twenty five dollars for yeah, a signed Huff of yeah. Moose album. It's it's I think that was one of the last times that there was like a real 
um, I think significant radio supported scene yeah. in in, uh, in the Philly area. You know, my because yeah, I thought Huff and Moose, I thought Huff and Moose was as big as any other band on that station because they played it so frequently. Yeah, they I were, had no clue until years later that it was just like a local band from like Chester. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, them and um, my my buddy John Fay. He's um, I, I th- I'm pretty sure Ike is is disbanded. I'm not 100 percent sure at this point, but he was in the Caulfields. Okay. Um, and I remember hearing that was them. like uh, what was the other one? He did the cover of In Your Eyes that was always on the radio. I just did a show with Jeffrey Gaines. Jeffrey Gaines, like yeah, like that's another one where I assume that that song was like internationally known by everybody. And then, like, you find out, like, yeah, it was pretty popular, but, like, this area, it was This is the spot, huge. yeah. I mean, that's a lot, like, there's, you know, there's Hooters songs yeah. that, you know, like, the Hooters were uh, really, really small until And they started, point. like, a punk band before they kind of went, like, new wavy in the 80s. Like, it's you listen true, to their early yeah. Stuff. They, they went a lot of different directions. <laughs> yeah. And they're huge in, um... Even their two biggest singles don't sound like the same band. Like, if you no, listen to really All You don't. Zombies and And We Danced, you... You couldn't convince someone those are the same. No, it would be a, it'd be a hard sell. <laughs> yeah. They're huge in uh, I think Germany and Austria, <laughs> uh, which is just like you know. So basically, it's just Germany. You know? <laughs> so, I because I'm I guess because of my like classical training, I just consider that those two. I just they're the same country <laughs> to me because yeah. But uh, they um, that's a fascinating thing. I mean, Hall and Oates one of my biggest influences. Um, I didn't even realize they were my biggest influences until I got into them only a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I already like really know all this like yeah. this band's catalog. That was, that was the, I remember I went to download one of their songs because I'd heard, like I was like, man, I really got that Rich Girl song stuck oh, in my what head. What a great tune. And I downloaded it, and I'm like, this song's pretty good. Let me see what their other stuff is. And every song I download, I'm like, oh, I know this. Yeah, and then you <laughs> binge on it for... <laughs> There's, I mean, like, you make my dreams come true is like uh, easily one of the greatest songs ever written. Hands down, <laughs> like, I, I, I've never. I don't think any time that comes on, I have almost their whole discography, at least like Hall and Oates discography on, um, on a, on my, you know, my thumb drive that I have in my car. Yeah. And, uh, that anytime anything comes on shuffle, like not only will I listen to it the whole way through, like I'll listen to it like three or four times, and I'll be like, <laughs> I guess I can move on to the next song. <laughs> Whenever it comes up. Have you covered that yet? Have you done a live loop of You Make My Dreams? I haven't. I've been messing around with that. I'm actually doing... Uh, I, I All Hall and Oates month? It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whole EP of them. Um, because I've done Private Eyes. Nice. And um, I have a video of that up on, on my YouTube. And that's, yeah, I feel like I remember watching one of the Hall, uh, a Hall yeah. and Oates cover. And I'm like, I don't think it was You Make My Dreams. Yeah. I did <laughs> Private Eyes. I'm, I'm going to do... Uh, the EP is going to be... Um, and it'll all be with the instrumentation that I do live for the most part so it'll be like beatbox for the drums and the different synth stuff here and there and then uh guitars and violin and that all you know if i need to filter things with effects then i will but it's gonna be uh it's gonna be cool so it'll be you make my dreams and a uh, rich girl and i'll probably do she's gone um and i'll do uh, uh i won't go did, for that did you do uh did you say man eater Man I probably Eater. will do Man Eater. It's you know what? It's, it's not prob- their best song, but it's, it's my a great least. Head. Yeah, it's, it's got to be my least still. favorite Hall and Oates song. But it's still got an awesome. It's sax still a solo. great, still a great song. <laughs> They're one of the few acts that can still, I think, get away with a rocking sax solo and a rock song because <laughs> usually you hear it, you're like, ah. Unless you know. it's like a '50s throwback, like unless right. you're doing it and you're trying to sound as much '50s rock mm-hmm. as possible, you can probably pull it off. Period. But yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard to put a, a bitch in sax solo, and being a sax player, like that, it's a all I ever imagine now when I think of saxophone players is that internet video of the guy playing "Careless Whisper" by George <laughs> Michaels. <laughs> 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 Like, yeah, I yeah, want every that's... sax player in every band to look like that guy. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> like or the dude from uh, Lost Boys is performing on the beach. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna be able to get that visual out. <laughs> Just jacked with oil all over his body in a uh, ponytail. Yeah, it, if there's anything that makes you, like discourages you from wanting to practice, it's that. <laughs> Just like, I don't want it, it's to. It's a gateway. You don't want people to be listening to me and imagining that. In their yeah, head. yeah. Or like if you if you if you focus all of your energy on it, will you end up covered in oil? Like. <laughs> You're kind of like, I need to take this to the next plateau. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he got really deep into saxophone. Now he's just like always creased up and stuff. <laughs> always shirtless. Always shirtless. Pelvic <laughs> thrust the whole time yeah, he's yeah. playing. <laughs> <laughs> Ponytail that just goes for days. <laughs> That's reckless. Well, and then, like, I, like, I don't listen to the radio at all anymore. And I, no, not and too I, much. 
don't think like there isn't. It's not that there's bad music right now, because there's a lot of great bands out there. Certainly, but I, I have this firm belief that the '90s, more than any other decade, was like the decade where the popular films and the popular music were also the most critically acclaimed. Like it was like one of those yeah. rare times where like it was like critically acclaimed music was popular. <laughs> it's true. I think that was one of the last real real peaks of that. Uh, my favorite year of the 90s is 1996. As far as um, all music genres are concerned, if we're talking hip-hop, like 92, 93, 94, just the best shit that ever came out. Because okay, that's but, like right when, for me, like for me, it doesn't get better than like a Tribe Called Quest and like yeah. Beastie Boys and... Far Side. Far side. Uh, I mean, the far, Bizarre Ride to the Far Side is probably, if not the best, one of the top five greatest hip-hop albums that's ever been Unbelievable. put together. And it's all the more depressing that all their other CDs just are okay. They're yeah. not bad. Like, none of their albums are bad, but they're just compared to how incredible that it's CD true. is. It's true. I mean, so there's so much good stuff, but I remember that night, year 96, that was my, uh, my first year in middle school, and um, hearing Song 2, uh, which was such a unique sounding song because it was like a reinvention of grunge, which was crazy. Um, at least it was. I, I, well, felt I like, like it was. that it was like I almost feel bad because it was making fun of it more yeah. than anything. Like yeah. it was like a song that was written like, oh fucking, we're we're artists. This is what grunge is, and then it was their only U.S. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then he goes on and he starts the Gorillas. But uh, I remember, which there, Gorillas are. For Phenomenal. Yeah. Like, the Gorillas are, like, a perfect track record band, as far as I'm concerned, album-wise. Absolutely. <laughs> Although, I feel like the records, it's interesting. They always sound kind of like a mixtape. Like, it's they just, they're like, they're like, what? Who made, who decided? Like, a mixtape made by someone that had never, ever thought about making a mixtape before. I was like, <laughs> I'm just going to dump, dump a bunch of songs together. I remember I hated the self-titled the first time I heard it, because I didn't know what I was getting. Like, I'm like, I uh, really yeah. like this Clint Eastwood song, so I'm going to assume that this is what everything else is going to sound like. And it's like... A minute long punk song followed by like a Latin groove for five minutes, followed by like like a techno song, followed by a rap song. Like it's it's a it's like a you know seventy five to eighty minutes of being inside the head of someone that is severely schizophrenic. (laughs) But it introduced me to Del the Funky Homo Sapien, so I can't be too disappointed with with that album anymore. Great, his his delivery is fantastic. He, I mean, he is. Uh, I always get that one song stuck in my head. Uh, if you must, the, you gotta wash your ass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? what? It's like, you're related to Dr. Dre and Ice Cube, or like whoever it is that he's related to. <laughs> it's, I, I'm trying to think. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. Um, it, it is interesting, and so Matt. Geeky. Like, it's extremely so... geeky. They're, they're not concerned at all with... with Image. It's funny for a, for a band that's not concerned with image to basically be completely defined by image. Like they're cartoon characters. Yeah. Like they are literally <laughs> well, that's an like, image. <laughs> I, I like I like the. There's like a lot of rappers out there that it's so anti-image. It's amazing. Like it's I, absurd, yeah. I talked to. Uh, I almost got into a fist fight with a chef at one of my jobs because I told him that Wu Tang Clan is a bunch of nerds. And he got really defensive about that. I'm like, no, I'm not saying it as a negative thing. I'm like, listen to 36 Chambers, man. Like, yeah. there's superhero references. There's Transformer references. The, the fucking The Method Man song is a Hall & Oates sample mixed with the opening line being a Rolling Stones song. Like, they're a bunch of geeky, <sighs> comic book reading, mm-hmm. video game playing, kung fu loving guys. Yeah, it's, that's like, true. Like, they never, as much as their music sounded hard, you really listen to the lyrics... They're not one of those guys that's really, you know, worshiping the whole pimp, gangster, kill a bunch of people attitude. Yeah, they, <laughs> they're they're a lot deeper than than this. so. There's like the superficial level, and then yeah. and that's like I mean that anything. And there's that, some stuff that's still fun in the superficial. <laughs> level. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, for me, I mean that's that's the two thousands. It's <laughs> like, like looking back on it, I'm like, wow, that that was like a really just that would have blown decade like there's just <laughs> there's some shining stuff but like usually like I'll listen I listen to Sirius a good bit when I'm in the car um so I'll listen to the hits channel just to if I hear something that's you know a currently breaking hit cause you usually hear it there before it becomes a US ra- like radio like, yeah. chart topper so it's good if I want to do a video cover. And try to get it something. right as yeah, it's right about before, to break. Yeah, right before, yeah, right as it's breaking, um, or right before. Because um, that's kind of the big thing. Like, if you're not the first one to do that cover, yeah, you might as well not first. do it. First! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you, like, 
Like, because some asshole, when you post it, is going to post a link to their video and be like, um, I already did this one. Fitz, yeah, get your yeah. shit together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the first one to not, like, first one to copy someone's. I just, <laughs> it's like, I don't know. I, I enjoy doing the, I enjoy the challenge of, of um, doing it with the looping equipment. But, uh, so I'll listen to this stuff, and I'll hear things, and I'll be like, oh, okay. But I'll hear a lot of stuff that I'm like, eh, nobody's going to remember this in a year. Yeah. And when I turn on, if I'll s- switch on to the the channel um, that's all 2000s hits, I literally, almost every song that comes on, I'm like, ugh, <laughs> this, this song again. Like, all those songs, I, I feel like the 2000s is like the decade of pop songs that are only great for nostalgic purposes. Yeah, you're <laughs> like, like, hey, remember that song? <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, that you, sucked. Yeah, <laughs> like the song, all the song is good for is it reminds you of a good time that happened while that song was on the background. And you're like, oh, yeah, there was that party and I heard this song and that was that was yeah. a fun party. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I was graduating high school. Like, that was really fun. Cool. Yeah, I, yeah. There's that part of me that's like, man, it sucks that I graduated in like the mid-2000s instead of like mid 90s i would have had such a much i I think i would have had a better time if i was graduating and like i graduated and bought the the sublime cd instead of like sublime being no more by the time i was about to enter junior high like that's kind of it's true (laughs) i I think at this by the same um you know at the same time like I think you'd be angrier as someone oh, that, as, 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 a, a human like, being. as a human being now as someone that had graduated then like just like for the last two decades just losing your mind. There was <laughs> there was a I can't remember if I saw it on YouTube or if it was an article, but it was this amazing thing where oh I know exactly what it was. Someone had did a mashup. It was like a ten minute mashup just using music videos of the top hundred songs from two thousand, and it was oh, all God. the music videos. And then someone did another one of all the top songs from, like, 2001, 2002-ish. Okay. And someone had commented with a link to the two of them, and they had pointed out the difference in the coloring in the pre-9-11, 2000 stuff, Mm. and the post-9-11 stuff, because he's like, you look at these music videos, and everything's bright fluorescent colors, and, like... And it's like these happy, fun videos, and then you hit like 2002, and all the videos are darker, and it's like this. That's very true. Yeah, and he's like, and it's really weird. Like he's like, you like it makes sense that that would change for a little bit, but that kind of that, that changed lasted steer- for like four or five years of the way music videos were visually presented. Turn down like, the saturation a little bit more. Yeah, like think about the lit music videos that used. Oh to come my out. god, they were like super bright colors, <laughs> like. Like, it looked like the De La Soul videos, where it was like, yeah. did they just discover what color is? Yeah, yeah, literally, like, <laughs> that, and, like, like let's change the Prince. tint yeah. entirely, like, yeah, everything yeah, like Fresh Prince, li- Fresh Prince's parents just don't understand, it looks like he's living in a cartoon, the colors yeah. are so vivid. <laughs> it's nuts, it, it is absolutely nuts, like, the, the vibrance, saturation, the contrast, everything is just, like, cranked, it, it, <laughs> It's nuts. And then they turn that all the way down. <laughs> Next yeah. Year, shut it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No more time for fun. Yeah, that was... <laughs> no the, 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 fun. Well, everything changed. The content in... in, um, in not in, not even just musically, but uh, television and film. There's a lot of stuff like... I, I, I have a conversation um, a handful of times um, about the movie uh, Fight Club. That, that final scene in Fight Club when they're standing there oh, and yeah, the buildings are going down. Two like, years later, that, that would have never... That would have never... They could have never made that. I don't even think that, like... I mean, maybe now, since there's so many movies where just built... Like, whole cities are just, like, <laughs> destroyed. Yeah. But um, then, it's, it's, it is interesting, like, the tone and, and what, like... Well, even what people like, would cheer for. And, I, I mean, it's... I understand... There's like four or five comedies from like 2001 that didn't get released for like three or four years mm-hmm. because they all dealt with a terrorist going onto a plane with a bomb. Yeah. Like there was like Big Trouble was the one that I always think of with uh, Tim Allen. What like, a terrible name. Like to, it like just <laughs> yeah. way to trivialize it. Big Trouble? <laughs> it, that uh, just sounds like a Tim Allen movie. <laughs> like, it's actually, surprisingly, it's a good movie, but it's got an amazing cast. It's like... Tim Allen, uh, Putty from Seinfeld, oh, you can't go Jason Lee, uh, Janine Garofalo, uh, DJ Quills, 
I forget who. Oh, I'm... yeah. What happened? What was with him? He was in everything for a while. <laughs> and then where did he even come? Where did he even come from? I don't know. I think he imploded into himself. He just kind of he, he always looked like he was partially imploded into himself. <laughs> he was just that guy that you like saw the trailer for road trip, and you're like, what the fuck's wrong with that kid? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, is he gonna? Are, are they gonna win like best makeup for this movie? Because they did an amazing job, look making him look weird. And you yeah. saw the new guy, and you're like, oh, that's just what he really looks like. Yeah, are they gonna <laughs> feed that guy? Somebody get this guy something. Get him the least healthy shit in the world. I hope he put weight on. I hope he put weight on. I so worry how about sad him would it, How sad would it be though if he did, and that's why you haven't seen him in a while? It's yeah, just like, he like, you lost really your big. appeal. But it's, <laughs> like he got really no, big, but his head even, didn't. Not even really big. I can imagine him just looking like a like normal, normal person, person, and they're like, and his no. manager's just like, it's over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> his manager just hangs up on him. <laughs> You've blown it. It's so sad, but that's actually like the world that we live in with managers. It's true. Like you well, have he's that a character weight. actor. Yeah. Like if you break. You make it at a particular weight and height, you better not fucking grow another inch or put on another pound or your career is done. Patton Oswalt <laughs> has a bit about that, and I'm trying to think who he's talking about. He's at a cocktail party, and he's like, I decided that I, I need to... Uh, he's like, I'm looking around at everybody, and um, everybody's in such good shape, and there's me. And, then, and he's like, I'm, I decided I was going gonna, gonna to eat healthy. I'm going to stop eating all this stuff. So he's like, I'm at this cocktail party, and nobody's eating anything that's coming around on the trays. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, no, I won't have it. And he's like, after uh, about 20 minutes, I'm like, ah, screw it. And I start eating it. And he's, he said that he's there with this guy who's a you know, famous, tra- uh, huge track record character actor. Um, and uh, they end up getting to talk, and Patton is saying, like, sees the guy and says to him, like, I'm such a huge fan of you and everything, yeah. and they're talking to him. The guy has no idea who Patton Oswalt yeah. is. And they're talking for a little while. And I um, a cartoon rat in a movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your kids might know my voice. <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's really strange. Um, so, like, they, they, you know, like, 20 minutes of talking and stuff, he walks away. And um, a little bit later, he sees him again, and he comes over, and he's like, good thing we're fucking character actors, and nobody gives a shit about what we look like. And it just, like, <laughs> buries his face in bacon. Like, <clears throat> it is it is funny, like, yeah, because if Patton was in, like, really good shape, he probably wouldn't be in the demand that he's in. No, not at all. Yeah. Imagine if Steve Buscemi put on weight. <laughs> like, it might be the only thing that could balance out his eyes. Like, but like, think about how long you've known who Steve Buscemi is, looking like and that. How he's looked exactly the same since like '92. Yeah, looking like, <laughs> like that classroom skeleton that's in every '80s like <laughs> teen movie, like basically dressed with clo- you know skin on it. Like, he's, it, he's one of those guys that. Uh, there's, like, that group of people who first saw them in, like, Reservoir Dogs, and that's how they always know them. And then there's that group of people that's our age who we first saw them in Billy Madison, and that's what we relate them yeah, to. Yeah, and you're like, what the hell is wrong with that guy? <laughs> Why does he keep looking at me? That and Big Lebowski just, really, like, oh, they just, you know, piling up on him. I just love when there's, like, those actors that you, you know them from, like, their goofy, like, one time, like, oh, I'll do one goofy movie that you happen to see as a kid, and that's no matter how many great films they do, you're always just like, They're yeah, known for that. You were, yeah. you were Billy Madison, buddy. <laughs> yeah, well, like, I can't take Brendan Fraser, for, like, seriously at all. Because like, he was Airheads? Yeah, <laughs> like, not. I can't watch anything that he's in. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're the action hero? <laughs> Why did they call Brendan Fraser to be the action hero? Like, couldn't you have called Liam Neeson? Uh, although I can't, I can't see Liam Neeson in any other context other than like the "I'm going to find you and I'm going to kill you." And that's only he's recently. That in, and he's it. But then you start looking back in other movies and you're like, he's always that guy. <laughs> hey, you find your thing. It's a niche. <laughs> I didn't even. I never even thought of him as like a like a like a badass kind of character. He just came out of nowhere and just like he did Taken and suddenly he was like the most badass actor that had ever existed. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I was like, what that, Liam Neeson? (laughs) Well, that's like when Zach Galifianakis finally broke mainstream Yeah, and you're like, wow, this guy's, like that dude hates his movies that he's in because it has nothing to do with what his actual sense of humor is. Yeah. Like like you watch (laughs) his stand up and you're like, man, no wonder he like, doesn't really do that much publicity for his films because it's not yeah. his sense of humor at all. <laughs> yeah, his sense of humor is you have to really, you have to, it's unique. I mean, he's got a niche audience and everything. I always thought he was funny. It's that cringe kind of 
funny. Yeah. My he played a free show at Penn State and I didn't get to see it. My friend saw it. Okay. And he said that he's on stage and he's playing this beautiful piano piece and he's doing the thing that he always does, playing beautiful piano pieces and just saying offensive stuff. <laughs> And he's like, and the whole time there's just, a, he's like, they had free beer at the show. So there's some drunk asshole in the crowd that is just screaming at him quotes from The Hangover, because it was like right after The Hangover oh, came God. out. He's like, and he's playing this beautiful piano piece, and he just stops what he's doing, looks right at the guy, and says, I will skull fuck you in the parking lot tonight. <laughs> and then goes right back to playing the beautiful piano piece. He's like... It couldn't have been more awkward and hilarious at the exact same time. Because like, that was him genuinely pissed off, and then him just acting like it didn't happen a second like, later. right back. <laughs> <laughs> and that takes skill. Like, to, to, oh, yeah. to just snap right back into it and be like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get a laugh, but I'm going to express my anger and disgust towards this person. I realized recently, because I, 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 I don't really play them as really at all anymore but when i was younger i played a lot of really rowdy places um where you'd be fighting to keep people from grabbing the mic from you while you were singing or yeah. banging into it like i got my teeth knocked you know the mic knocked into my teeth so many times um or people falling over onto your stuff and that sort of thing and i i realized like um that there's a line and there's a lot of people that don't know the line like in that in that case and there's yeah. when you're in that kind of situation and people are acting like really, 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 uh, like poorly, you know, not well behaved um, children. Like you have to talk to people like that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, like- I've stopped playing um, stuff, and the worst is when it's like it's like like a woman in her like late fifties that I have to like scold <laughs> because she's not only like. It's annoying to I understand like you know it's but it's if it's annoying to a point okay but when it becomes like dangerous for myself and also like dangerous for everybody else cuz I'm worried about losing my teeth yeah. or having you know uh my you know like $6000 violin uh fallen smashed, on yeah. yeah and smashed like I like so it's funny yeah but then like as soon as you're done like handling that it's back to back to what yeah, I was the, doing Yeah cuz the rest of the crowd's like I don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, it's funny. Like I didn't. You have to. It's almost like being a, a school teacher, like with a really like uh, just reckless group of kids in the class. Like you gotta, you gotta like take lay into them. No, I've never yelled anything like Zach. Yeah, I've just, I've just talked like very calmly. Like, look. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh. Yeah. It's it's funny. We I think in any trade that you work in, well, you just find a way to make them like I I've, I have not played that many shows. And usually, I'm always the opening act. So, you know, you don't really have a huge crowd at the start of a show anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing a song that was a, uh, it had a sing-along part. I was trying to get the crowd to sing along, and no one was singing along. And uh, I remember I stopped the song in the mid-song and just said, guys, there's like fucking seven of you here. Like, I can see that you're not singing along. Can you just humor me for one goddamn minute? Like, (laughs) like, Like, and just like... And I played it out the way I wanted to play it out. Like, it started off as a calm conversation, and it just kept building as, like, <laughs> angrier and angrier until I'm, like, just screaming at them. Yeah. And then just immediately went back to playing the happy song, and they were all singing along with it then. I'm like, that, like I had to play it like that. Any other way of being like, please, please, guys, please, it wouldn't have worked. No. But, like, turning it into part of the performance of, like, watching a breakdown. Well, you know what also you end up doing there is people all of a sudden, because you've directly talked to them, they yeah. feel like they know you now. So not only have you kind of made them, like, get over their insecurity of being the first person to clap or the first person to sing along or whatever, like, now you've actually, even though it was, like, a very one-sided and negative <laughs> conversation, you've had a conversation <laughs> with them, so you've actually connected with people, and then they, they actually feel... A bit more inclined, but I don't know how many times I've played places. Well, last night, for example, I was playing. Uh, I was playing in a place, and um, uh, I finished. And it's the type of place that um, you are. It's it's a type of private uh, venue that your your background. And I'll do them from time to time to, to fill in my schedule on on nights. Um, and uh, they they pay well too, so they like they give me the autonomy to take risks and play shows that I'm like, 
I'm probably not going to sell that many CDs, and the guarantees maybe not even there. You know, like, do you use that time to like, <clears throat> like? I guess here's my question: Was would that be an ideal show to test out something that you want to do live at like a more predominant show, yeah, or is that where, I, I, where like you just stick to what works and just do it to get it done? Um, I never like to. I don't, I never want it to feel like work. Yeah. So, um, you know, there I have played plenty of gigs where, um, you know, in the past several, several years where it has felt like at some point, like feels like work. Yeah. Like I, mean? I just got to get done this shift and get home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really feels like a shift. And that, that stinks, you know, as like, as an artist and as someone that wants to connect with a crowd, like the only reason I play music is because I want to connect with people and have the exchange of what I put into what I'm giving them. I want them to at least get some of that out. And if they do, I get it back when they get it. You know, I mean, so do you like, do college tours? Because I feel like that would be like the stuff that you do colleges. would be like, pro, like I'd imagine that a college is they'll eat that shit out of your hand. I love playing <laughs> the colleges, but you know what? The interesting thing, unless they directly contact you, the college scene um, is you have actually, to be within like that little like secret society of managers uh-huh. or whatever, <laughs> and it costs a lot. It yeah. costs a lot just to be considered. I, I played in a band for a while that. Um, we did those conferences. And yeah, because I used to go to those conferences to book bands. You were, at Penn okay, State. so you're one of the buyers, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we would do and I those. I was like, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, they're really kind of like sterile, um, the showcases. And usually you're paying as a, as a band uh, just to be there to be able to showcase, you're paying like maybe like $1,500 to get your 20 minutes yeah. to play. And if no one books you, you're you're just out that fifteen hundred, and it's really weird how some of those bands like that's their like they are bigger doing the college circuit than they ever would be on like a major record label. Like there's like four or five oh, bands yeah. I can think of that like they would never even consider <laughs> like going it's, anywhere else. It's <laughs> true. I mean the the one band that I the band that I was with uh, we. Um, we did outstanding on that. We had we had representation. Um, we were on a really uh, it was, it was we, I think we were the only band on with this management company. Um, they represented um, like the Sklar Brothers. Nice. Um, and the, the guy that played Mr. Belding. I I remember their little area. Yeah, <laughs> and, and Gallagher was like I think There's, Gallagher was I one of them. I feel like there there was a band that someone represented. I can't remember what the hell they were called, but they were like a ska band. Like it was like a big like eight piece band and i forget what their name was but it started with a p and it was like an abbreviation like pmj or pjm or something like that i think i know who you're talking about and i remember the year that i went to the conference it was right after napoleon dynamite was like huge and they were giving out vote for pmj shirts oh my God. <laughs> like, like if you just went and shook their hand you get a free shirt and i ended up with like three of them because we were there for like a weekend so like every time i saw them I'm like hey take a shirt i'm like okay Killer. Killer. <laughs> so much money that's me i know how much it costs to print to print that many shirts it's like, very expensive it's crazy to, like, to, to give, give away them. soft merch like yeah. wow so um <laughs> yeah i mean so i love doing that but it's it's tough well, i was playing this gig though last night which which is like the the inverse of of that and um you know like if i you don't expect crowds in that setting to even notice like, you pay. Yeah. yeah i mean like i never do a show differently than th- from one night to the next i perform i give every bit of me every single place i play no matter who i'm playing for how many people i'm playing for like i it's the same show you're getting so there's never like a oh, i'm here and like going through the motions it's never that so like i'm like up there doing it and i finished the first song and like nothing, and I'm just like, how you guys doing? And like nothing, <laughs> and I'm like, no, really? I'm like, you, n- none of you are doing well. <laughs> and then this one girl was like, yeah, I'm like clapped and like put her hand, like put her drink up. I'm like, I'm like, well, at least we've got one. And then like her friend was sitting next to her was like. I'm also having fun. Like, it was just like the most awkward thing in the world. And, like none of the guys that were at their table like just turned into like a pole. It was just. <laughs> It was just so weird, you know, like uh, so super sterile. But when you when you start like directly addressing people in the crowd, then it's the same thing as like yelling at people in the crowd yeah. or whatever. We're just walking. Like I go on a break if I'm playing several sets. I talk to everybody, and I think you have to like yeah. you have to separate. That I think that there's an ego that some people have where they they want to have that appearance of 
Like, I'm the I'm, I'm the, the star here. I'm the talent. Yeah, I'm, like, and you have to you have to drop that and be able to just like walk out in the crowd and be like, "Hey, I'm a human being like you, and I also have feelings." <laughs> and, and sometimes when no one's paying attention to me, when the spotlight's on me, yeah. it hurts my feelings a little bit. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, hello there, citizen. I just wanted to have a little chat with you. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It 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 is weird. I you know when I was there, there are certain places that. Um, that I will not do that at, and that is when they I finish playing, and all of a sudden it's like I'm in a loud club. Just yes, yeah. it's like a thousand decibels. <laughs> like I'm not going to push my voice at all because I need to get back up there and sing. Yeah, and the first thing it goes if I really push myself is my voice, and which in in the case of the music you do is also your percussion. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, um, like you you lose the voice. And the percussion yeah. in one in one swoop. <laughs> it's it's insane. So you know, thankfully, you can actually. I think you could pull off if you had to. I think you could entertain a crowd with like forty five minutes of you just doing instrumental stuff between the guitar have, and the violin. And I have <laughs> like, yeah. there, there, like push comes a shove. <laughs> and I can get through. I mean, I've I've learned what I can do. Like when I've lost the top end of my voice, um, if I've pushed it, and the only usually the only time that happens now is if I'm sick. It's hard for me to keep it. Or apparently it. if you do a DMX impression. <clears throat> oh, I lose my voice immediately after <laughs> doing that. Which I was so bummed when you were like, yeah, I'm going to be doing a show at five. I'm like, oh, man, I still want to hear that DMX. <laughs> <laughs> like, I know, challenges. It is It is very frustrating. Um, there's stuff like that. Or, or if I do, like, six sets. Um, which when I played the shore, this is my first summer not doing like uh, Sea Isle and Avalon and Ocean City and stuff at the Jersey Shore. Um, I did Atlantic City a couple nights ago, and I'll, I'll be doing AC probably like at least once a month. Um, so is the casino crowd like, like? I actually think that the casino crowd is a crowd that I need to play for more. Okay, like I I do I do so incredibly well. There's a there's a stigma around it. When someone sees you in that setting, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be this the this act is here in this casino, therefore they are good. Yeah. Just even if they're terrible, people will there's a there's, there's a like thing that mentality there. like they wouldn't book bed yeah. stuff here. Yeah. I mean there's like there's there's people that play all sorts of venues that like have the stigma of like you'd be you have to be good to be there and aren't yeah like it's there's i mean and there's places that you're like there's no way they'd have good entertainment and they have some somebody come in that's brilliant yeah so like there's you can never totally go off that but there are a lot of people that that can't gauge and they gauge based on that based on context and that's the same for anything like if someone that is an okay singer is on a singing show and then they, you know, make it a couple rounds, and then they decide they're going to book a bunch of shows, like a tour nationally, and they get someone to represent them or whatever, and they do that. People that see them are going to be like, oh my god, they're so good, because number one, they're familiar with them from a big medium that says, like, if I saw you on there, you must be good. Yeah. <laughs> number two, th like, that's the only thing yeah. that mattered, was number you, one. Yeah, you were on America's <clears throat> Got Talent, so therefore you must have talent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there's so there's that, <clears throat> and then you could have someone that'll blow the you know just blow their socks off, blow the you know the hinges off the doors that um, no one will even pay attention to. So that's an interesting thing. And so it's either that I think in a casino, or it's like this is going to be gimmicky as shit. Yeah, like, like my only experience with seeing live music at a casino mm -hmm. is uh, my uncle is one of the founding members of Chico's Vibe. Oh yeah, I know yeah. Chico's vibe. Yeah, yeah, he's the key, uh, the keyboard player mm. and second singer. Um, and they played Harris once, and I think they only played once. They may have played a second time ever, but I remember that show. It was a great show, and like the the room was full, and they were like, it was awful. People, the manager kept telling us to turn it down more, turn it down uh, more because we were the disrupting the the people gambling. <clears throat> and he's like, and it's just such a headache. He's like, I just want to play my music. You know, that's <laughs> like, that's such a pain. I I mean, I've played. You know, I, I could list a, a handful easy um, of places through through the last ten years um, that I played. You know, starting in high school, um, that I would uh, they you know the, you'd have a 
someone that doesn't know anything about music. And yeah. that's unfortunately a lot of places. A lot of promoters. <laughs> yeah, well, that, yeah. <laughs> promoters of venues. That, that and a lot of, like, <laughs> places that have entertainment that aren't venues, there's, there's sometimes there are people, I, I know some, some amazing people um, that, um, that just that that uh, are the you know manager or whatever that at some places there's a place in media that I'm playing tomorrow night Picasso and um the woman that handles all the music there loves music and knows about it and champions it and is just so pleasant to work with and there's a lot of places that I actually almost only places now that I play are are places like that but I yeah, play because you start to figure out where like you that's yeah, the where, part about where, being, where, where am I to, actually respected? Yeah, yeah, you have to deal with the shit shows to figure out where's the places that you're worth going to versus exactly. not wasting your time. Right, and you know, and and I think people don't understand sometimes. It doesn't matter how big the crowd is. No, because it if doesn't. you're playing a place for the first time, that crowd will grow the more and more that you come to that place. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of were you treated with respect while you were there, or right. did you like? Pack up your shit and run to the car as soon as you possibly could. That that yeah, I mean, when the unfortunate thing is when you have someone that is just like handling the business side of like I'm going to fill this calendar with blah 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 blah, and it doesn't matter, and I'll go with anything. Then you know you might have great music, you might have bad music, but you also have someone that doesn't understand the logistics involved in what they what they booked. So like, you can't hire a five piece rock band and expect them to be quiet. Yeah. You know, and you, you can't also book a nine piece. Yeah. You can't like a sport. horn band and be <laughs> like, I'm like, you guys need to turn down or the word, the funniest thing I've heard since I was a kid was, uh, you guys need to turn the drums down. <laughs> oh yeah. There's turn down the drum amp, huh? <laughs> like what? So, I mean, when you have people that don't even understand anything about it, like that's in any field, like I, but I think it, it's, it's almost like a pandemic with, with the music business on a certain tier, um, where there's countless people that don't know anything about the job that they're in. And I don't think that flies in any other, in any other thing. So like, I'm sure you've played shows where you're like, they didn't think this through at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've turned down shows because I'm like, they didn't think this through at all. Like I'm an acoustic guitar player who sings silly songs about like slapping people with penises. Yeah. When I get invited to play an all metal show at yeah. a bar, I'm like, uh, we're hired yeah, to play a mitzvah. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, no, nah, I'm probably not going to do this one. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, so there's a lot of like stuff that I think really needs to get corrected. And when I when I get to a certain point, I know that I'd like to try to take the reins and um and you know on the side uh to however large a capacity I can um really try to to cause a shift yeah in the way of thinking with uh with the business do you have a uh because we're starting to wind down to the end of the interview i do have to ask do you have a follow-up coming up for for layers i feel like layers has been out for like two years now or so. year just just, just a year uh, let's see uh september 13 so just under a year okay i don't know why i felt like it was so much longer <laughs> it, it maybe it just has that <laughs> yeah, well it's got i think the way that it's because i just discovered you right as it came out and, and just like, immediately assumed that that had been like okay this has been out for a bit yeah <laughs> like, i i'm constantly putting stuff out and i'm always writing stuff but um i have been a lot of times when i sound check um I will if I'm not doing the sound because when I do the sound I, I have everything now it's it's just my setup never changes so it's homogenized so the only thing I'm really adjusting is master EQ or and master volume and a little bit of compression maybe but like um, you're definitely a quick setup and breakdown despite all the equipment despite all the stuff yeah, yeah like I remember I was very impressed with that because when you played our show because you were like it takes me ten minutes to set up. I'm like, I've heard that before. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it really does. If, I, if all my stuff is like there on the stage, I can do it, yeah. Um, so it's so there's that. But if I'm playing a place that I am not doing the sound and I'm not, you know, in the rare occurrence, I'm not doing my monitor mix or whatever myself, um, I will just build a groove uh, for my sound check and um, let the sound guy get the levels from that. And I... If I do something, it's always just made up on the spot. And if I do something that I really dig, I can save it in the loop station. Yeah. And I'll save that phrase. I'll write it, you know, to a phrase at the end of the memory where I, I never, you know, go because I clear the thing out every night. So it's not like uh, after every song. So um, uh, nothing's ever pre-recorded. And 
there have been times that I've, I'd say in the last couple months that I've, I've probably got a, like 12, 15 grooves that like I really did. There's something you want to do with That it. I'm going to do stuff with and I've already written, I've got melodies and, and lyrics written for a handful. So I, I'd expect a record coming out, um, a new one, probably again this fall. Right. I like that schedule of one a year. Just one a year? Why not? Because yeah. I'm doing so many things. Like to, to keep up with the throwback Thursday, that's like, you know, two days of focus time. Um, if it's a song that I know cold, I can blow through it in like eight hours. Yeah, I was going to say, do you have up? a couple like breaking case of emergency songs where it's like you wake up on Tuesday and you're like, oh shit. <laughs> like, yeah, you know what? It's usually I, I usually I, and it's terrible. I, I am, uh, I put too much stuff on my plate and I procrastinate. So I'm usually most of the, th- almost all the throwback Thursdays have been shot. Uh, I set up that morning, Thursday morning. And, uh, I set up Thursday. <laughs> everybody no, that, everybody that missed that, yeah. The, the I just of, dropped my cup. Yeah. It was pretty epic. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll like set up the morning Thursday and I'll decide the song. And then I will <laughs> learn the song and then I will shoot the song and hopefully get it in a take or two. It's just you sitting there like scrolling through the iPod. I guess you have like a multiple camera set up, right? Yeah, you- so I set up I set up so it's Throwback Thursday is the only thing that I do that's um with the exception of my other videos that are like live looping that um are totally shot live. It's all one take. So I have a usually at least one DSLR um, and if I only have the one, that'll be like a fisheye or a super wide angle, like a 14 yeah. millimeter that I'll shoot with. And, um, that'll get, you know, everything. And then I'll have, I have these Sony, um, not Sony, um, uh, Canon, these really small Canon point and shoots that have good sensors, um, and the ability to at least have a minimum focal depth yeah they don't have you don't have the luxury of having stuff like in the foreground in the background yeah. out of focus so your subject it's i use you don't have like a the, switchboard live though right you have to take all those tapes and all that stuff yeah so that all that stuff gets shot at um recorded the small cams 720p the the dslr at 1080 so i upscale the 720 to 1080 and then i um copy all that all that video uh the, on the sd cards onto into the computer and i do uh, all my video editing there and i have a brilliant i used to sync the uh, ma- the audio that i record in the studio because yeah. i shoot them in the studio so i mix the audio separately and then i export that and i used to sync it by looking at the footage um, at the waveforms of the audio, and that's great, and it but it can be time consuming. Well, I was gonna say, I, I'd say having watched almost every one of your thir- throwback Thursdays, it's like ninety nine percent of the time, it it's mm-hmm. pretty much synced up perfectly. Yeah, the only thing, and um, it, it's, it's there's like one of them that I love, and I always get like, and it's only one part of the, it's blurred lines for yes. some reason. The rap on blurred lines, you know what it is? You know what it is? The the way I, that it this, uploaded? <laughs> no, you know, I thought that. And I thought that um, it's the... When I started seeing it happen more often, I realized I was using a slower than Class 10 card in one of the side cams. And the side cam is the one that captures me when I'm doing the rap. Gotcha. And for whatever reason, it tracks the video with no problem. But the audio eventually gets off. And this yeah, is I, in I the raw like, video I'm file. like, why is this happening? Like, I'm like, because everything else is like... Yeah, it's synced. just the rap part. And I'm like, why is the rap part only up And it drives me nuts because <laughs> like it's way too late to pull it down. Yeah. yeah and, and that's... Um, I mean, that's one of my favorite ones that you've done. Thank you. Too. Because that one's... The best part about the videos, and I've said this a couple times before, but it's... I mean, the whole thing's cool, but just watching it come together yeah. and piece by piece and being like, okay, yeah, I remember that... like. You know, like, okay, the cowbell thing sounds like the cowbell thing. And, like, the beatbox, like, at first with the beatbox, you're like, well, that just could be anything. And right. then as the song builds around, you're like, no, that is the absolute appropriate <laughs> beatbox for this song. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's fun to reverse engineer them. Like, I, I have so much fun doing it. And it, and it's uh, it's cool. Like, a lot of the stuff that I learned in, in college, um, in my theory and orals classes and my composition classes, a lot of that training... Um, coming out and and like that skill set like i'm like wow i'm really really using everything i paid for like, <laughs> hey nothing wrong with actually getting your money's worth yeah out of yeah rare because that <laughs> yeah. seems like really rare for people now yeah. <laughs> i went to college and i'm a dog walker <laughs> so, like, so 
Uh, well, that degree's doing some some good work for me. <laughs> it's it is it is nice when when you can have that work for you. Um, it's it's cool to be able to reverse engineer it, and it has the frustration of that camera because I've noticed that even with a class ten card, um, sometimes there's that drag, and I've I'm more uh, aware of it now that I notice it when it's a frame or two off, and I'm yeah. able to catch it. The only time I miss it is um, when I have maybe like 30 to 40 minutes to not only copy everything but sync it yeah edit it fully export it and then re-export it with all my processing on the video so i get that for being able to sync it because that's like the hardest fucking part of editing it's a bitch you know i i i did it by eye for a long time and then i found um there's a company um called red giant that was acquired by uh i'm trying to think who they were acquired by but uh, a larger company, and um, they make some really brilliant video plugins. And okay. The one is uh, called Pluralize, and Pluralize, I think at the time was like 150 bucks or 175 bucks, and it analyzes all the waveforms, and it automatically synchronizes all the clips, and um, you have to do, you have to line throw them into the session with some logic behind it you can't just be like there's a bunch of files and boom then click and it's gonna fix it so you have to have like just a like little lose it together yeah, yeah, it just like fixes your mess like because like that would be amazing like some fucking peewee herman rube goldberg yeah. thing that makes his breakfast that just pops out your video for you yeah that like, would be amazing but hey, here's your information computer make it happen yeah which I, I i i guarantee in like 40 years oh it's we'll gonna be, be there we'll be there and, <laughs> which will be for better or worse and um so like so you, you put all that stuff in and it'll it'll automatically line everything up, which is great. And then from there, my edits can be a lot quicker. But every once in a while, the, if I, you know, have one of those smaller cams that I'm using for something that, like, is really hard to sync. Like, when I have it on my feet, usually, you know, I always have the cam on my feet. That one almost always gets off. Yeah. And I have to, like, go in and be really surgical and nudge the clips to, like, all right, I know this is where I put my foot down. Yeah. And I have to, like, get that, just that moment. Like, so even, like, putting my foot down on the pedal, then I have to, like, watch to see the, f- through my shoe, the toe, like, the action yeah. of the toe pushing <laughs> on, like... To get that, because otherwise, like, you're like, something's fishy here. Because <laughs> like, I don't want, everything I do is well, legit. I, always, I don't, I'm not. That's the thing. Fresh, I, and I yeah. was like, I want to show people this Blurred Lines one, but because the sync is off, I always feel like someone's going to be like, yo, the sync's off. This is bullshit. That ain't yeah. live. And I'm like, okay, yeah. let me find. So I actually, the one that I discovered is a masterpiece, because I used to just look at the length and be like, eh, maybe not. It was crazy. Oh, thank you, man. Oh, my God. And it, uh, Luke. I think you know Luke through somebody from Waking Mercury because he came out to see you live because yes. I think he knows like your like a sister or a cousin yeah, or something from the, from the band I was yeah. in with her yeah but uh, yeah he was like he told me he's like you need to watch his cover of Crazy he's like it is like the middle of that video you're just gonna feel your brain start to crumble <laughs> <laughs> he's like, and he he was he wasn't lying man that like. At first, I'm like, oh, this is a pretty straightforward cover. Right. Like, it's weird setting it to people because, like, yeah, great. He's, he's got a good voice and he can sing. I'm like, no, wait until, like, three minutes. Like, if you have to, skip ahead, but wait until three minutes. Yeah. And it's just like, whoa, you can do that? <laughs> <laughs> I always used to cover that song, and it was right when I was first getting into looping, and I had a loop pedal that could only do one phrase. And uh, I, I was starting to experiment with it and there were a lot of songs that I, I just couldn't do what I wanted to do with it but I was learning a lot and I was like I want to push this thing to which is what I always do like I have this hardware and I'm going to push it till I can't push it anymore yeah and uh, I remember doing it one night and uh I was like you know I'm going to loop the chorus progression which you know is the same progression for the whole song but it variates on on um on the second and third verses, um, the chords are, are kind of flipped around. So instead of doing a C minor, it does a C major. And instead of it going to the E flat following that, it goes to the G sharp or the A flat. So like it flips the chord order around. So I was like, I can either do the verse, which is essentially like after I've played the last verse or the second verse, like I'm only going to be able to use that one more time. If I've played the third verse, I can't use that ever again. It's There's pointless. So why am I going to solo over that? The big thing is the chorus. So I looped the chorus progression, and then it was like, 
I finished looping the progression and I'm like, all right, well, I had like a bass line in. So I, you know, playing that and I was like, all right, what else could I do? Well, I love that like 70s, you know, tight picked, um, palm muted, like, you know, <laughs> little thing. Like, well, let's harmonize that. And I'm like, just like kind of doing that and doing that. And I was like, oh, I'll do a violin line that echoes it. And then I'll do a line that echoes the violin line that echoes the guitar line. Yeah, there's like six like, or yeah. seven different violin parts by like the middle of that video. Yeah, it just stacks <laughs> and stacks and stacks. And I did it basically like that, and I really liked it. So the next night, I was playing at this point, I think, um, just as busy as I, I was busier then. I, like, I, I never, I, like, said no to nothing. So <laughs> I, like, just played constantly. And uh, I, I played it basically the same way the next night, and then it changed a little bit, and then changed a little bit, and changed a little bit. And then I realized, I got to the point after doing it like that for a couple of weeks, I'm like, I'm doing it the same way every night. Like, this is how I'm going to do the song. I figured out how to get out of the chorus. Uh, into that verse it was like if I play a violin solo I can't just hit stop and then start singing because I'm not holding the guitar so I can't go to the end of the chorus I gotta figure out a way to get to the end of the chorus with the solo and then have something that carries through it so that's like where the reverse symbol the shh that yeah. I do in so many things I use that because that draws you to a rest point. Yeah. So that and using the digital delay on the violin to have this giant like swell that's a yeah. melodic version of the thing. So getting that and gives me time to grab the guitar really quick and be like, and now back in the first. <laughs> yeah. So I've considered switching the arrangement up and and putting my beatbox on a phrase because I can do three phrases with my rig now. Um, do the beatbox on a phrase and then everything that's in that video do that on a second phrase so when i come back out i can have the percussion going but i think it loses the oomph of you going like it definitely giant when to it like, just comes oh, right back down to the bare bones yeah <laughs> and then and then i bring the loop back in after yeah. that verse and it's just like ah <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh it's fun man i'm glad to hear that uh you dig it all right well to wrap it up let's have you do a song yes. um do you know what song you're going to do for us I am. Uh, I, I was back and forth a ton about it because um, I, I I love all all the all the stuff I've written. I'm I'm really proud of it, and I love performing all of it equally. But um, the last uh, I actually just put a video of this tune up. Um, I did the a whole shoot. Um, I'm calling it the Whiteout Sessions, and it was um, shot super high high exposure, big white backdrop, um, blown out, and I put. Uh, um, the first tune, There's Just You, that I released to that, um, is from Layers. And uh, the last several shows that I've played, um, I hadn't been doing it for a while. And I did a couple festivals. I did Clark Park and I did the Trenton Ave Festival. And uh, it was the only tune of mine that I, I didn't do. And everybody uh, that bought records and stuff, um, I ended up getting messages from tons of people and comments, too, on the page, my Facebook page, um, saying, like, There's Just You, like, favorite song and the funny thing is like when i hear that because it's it's like a kind of like the oddball on the record yeah it's it doesn't there's common there's a common thread but like it doesn't everything else is very like kind of jazzy pop soul kind of retro soul sort of inspired like very jamiroquai meets daryl hall that kind of thing yeah, yeah and um this song was like i couldn't set it in any other setting than like this acoustic almost country rock kind of setting but then there's this reggae vibe to it in the middle like so the people that were like that would jam out to that and then i would play like poison or jump or um do bombs over baghdad or something <laughs> and then like they'd buy layers and they'd send me a message they were like love this song i was like really like <laughs> so it has to be it has to be like my biggest surprise it was the song that i wrote the fastest the lyrics were written almost right away made like one little revision the chord progression happened as i wrote the lyrics like i wrote the whole song maybe a half hour and um and, and it's i feel it's, like that's how great songs always come about though because yeah. you don't it's it's one of those like it just hits you yeah and you don't have time to overthink it and you don't have time to to keep toying with it and saying yeah. like, should, it's just like a natural emotion that's exactly. coming out exactly was the and last song, yeah. with that. and they do and they do and i i i think um you know the lyrics are are pretty personal on it and you know while still being vague i don't love to be extremely specific in songs because i don't like to uh i like to leave a little bit of mystery and I, but the mystery thing is 
to me. I, I for me, it's like how can how many different ways can this be interpreted? Because yeah. I don't necessarily mean it to to mean one thing. So uh, I'm gonna do uh, "There's Just You," which starts out super acoustic, and then um, using a looping gear, I'll add in uh, some percussion. I'll I'll play hand percussion on the on the uh, body of the guitar. Put some beatbox in there. Bring a bass line in, and then a big uh, string section. It's uh, and then it's that kind of that vacuum, just like in crazy, where it's just like all of a sudden, just like shoot, back to like nothing. <laughs> which I was trying to do a little bit of text painting with the title of the song. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if people want to check out more of your music, what's the best website for them to go to? BrianFitzy.com. Brian with an I, Fitzy with a Y, and not an S. Everybody, it's it's like Fitzgerald, just like an Irish <laughs> last name. It's not F I. Yeah, it's just B R I A N. F I T Z Y dot com. And you can check me out on Facebook. Uh, all my links, though. You go to the dot com. There's a little. It's all there. there. It's all right there. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me.
together, isolated from this scene. I wish we had forever, but when we choose to leave, the two of us will have each other with nothing in between. And that's all I need. I can't make no sense in this at all, and I'm so damn tired of trying. It's the way just an instant, you become the only thing on my mind. There's just you. There's just you. Mm, there's just you. There's just you. There's just you. There's just you.